It's Medicosis Perfectionellus, where medicine makes perfect sense, and today we'll talk about hemolytic uremic syndrome, so let's get started. So in the last video, we have discussed immune thrombocytopenic purpura or immune thrombocytopenia, but now we have hemolytic uremic syndrome. Why didn't we call ITP uh, ITP syndrome? Why just hemolytic uremic syndrome? Why syndrome? Why syndrome here but not here? In medicine, you have three types of things. You have a sequence, which means event one led to event number two, which led to event number three. Give me an example. You have the Potter sequence. How about a syndrome? A syndrome, there is a pathological cause, and there is one, two, three not related to each other, but they come together for some freaking reason. For instance, you have metabolic syndrome or syndrome X. There is abdominal obesity, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, high serum triglycerides, low serum HDL, and it's just stuff that come together, but one has nothing to do with the other. We call this a freaking syndrome. Another example is hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is today's topic. Why is it a syndrome? First, there is a pathological cause. It's the O157H7EHEC, and this is not my phone number and area code. So we have a pathological cause, and then we have a triad. We have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia and acute renal failure. One has nothing to do with the other, but they seem to come together. Welcome to hemolytic uremic syndrome land. So ITP is not a syndrome. You basically have IgG antibodies against the GPA2B3A receptors of the platelets. Now the platelets are toast. You have thrombocytopenia, which will lead to mucocutaneous bleeding. There is no syndrome. Everything makes sense here. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, however, doesn't make any freaking sense. You have E. coli, which is E. heck enterohemorrhagic E. coli, which produce a shiga-like toxin, and they are the O157H7 strain of E. coli. It produces bloody diarrhea. I can understand why E. coli leads to bloody diarrhea. This makes sense. Why microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and renal failure? It doesn't freaking make sense, and that's why it's a freaking syndrome. It's like Down syndrome. Why would trisomy 21 lead to stunted growth? short neck, bent fifth fingertip, single transverse palmar crease, flat head. I've no idea, and that's why it's a syndrome. This is my playlist on bleeding and coagulation disorders. Please watch these videos in order. Steps of hemostasis are many. The problem in hemolytic uremic syndrome is here, with a temporary plated plug or primary hemostasis. Secondary hemostasis is normal. It's fine. Since the problem with HUS is in primary hemostasis, platelet count will be low and therefore bleeding time will be high. However, secondary hemostasis or coagulation is fine. PT is normal, PTT is also normal. Hemolytic uremic syndrome and thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura are very, very similar. Some people consider them as a continuum. HUS is either atypical or typical. TTP is either inherited or acquired. Let's focus on HUS atypical, which is A, HUS, small a for atypical, happens in adults, and there is no diarrhea. Typical, however, happens in childhood, T for tiny, so adults for A, and tiny for typical, and it has diarrhea, which actually makes sense. If you ask an adult person, when was the last time you had diarrhea? Oh, maybe like a year ago, two years ago. If you ask a toddler, when was the last time you had diarrhea? Oh, doctor, I have diarrhea right now. And that's why it boggles my mind when a bunch of adults are hoarding toilet paper. Remember primary hemostasis or platelet plug formation. Whenever the platelets see an endothelial injury, they stick. We have compared between primary and secondary hemostasis before. Since HUS is a problem with primary hemostasis, platelet count will be low, bleeding time will be high, the patient might suffer superficial bleeding, but this is rare. The problem in HUS is with platelet count, which is platelet number, which will elevate the bleeding time. We have talked about the difference between thrombocytopenia and thrombocytosis before. HUS has thrombocytopenia, it's part of the triad. And if you have thrombocytopenia, I expect your platelet counts to be less than 150,000. All of these causes can raise the bleeding time, and hemolytic uremic syndrome is no exception. What are the clinical symptoms of primary hemostasis defect, such as hemolytic uremic syndrome? Many patients are asymptomatic. Mucocutaneous bleeding can happen. Deep anatomical bleeding will never happen. Almost never. 
But the platelets are not the only structure that suffer in cases of HUS. Red blood cells will also suffer. When platelets suffer, we call this thrombocytopenia because they decrease in number. When red blood cells decrease in number, we call this anemia. Anemia is divided into three categories based on the MCV, mean corpuscular volume. We have microcytic anemia when your red blood cell is so tiny it's unbelievable, or it could be normocytic, which has normal shape. However, the total red blood cell mass is down. That's why it's a freaking anemia. Or macrocytic, where you have those macrocytes or macroovalocytes. What kind of anemia happens in hemolytic uremic syndrome? It's normocytic because it's a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And hemolytic anemias are usually normocytic. Maybe later, if it's so severe, it can become microcytic. Maybe. Let's play this game. Hemolytic uremic syndrome. Tell me more about the normocytic, normochromic anemia and hemolytic uremic syndrome. Okay, is it hemolytic or non-hemolytic? It's hemolytic. Is it intravascular or extravascular? It's intravascular because the red blood cells will get destroyed and sheared into cystocytes inside the blood vessel, not in the spleen, and that's why it's intravascular. Okay, cool. Is it intrinsic or extrinsic? What do you mean by intrinsic? I mean intracorpuscular. What do you mean by extrinsic? I mean extracorpuscular. Is the fault inside the red blood cell or is the problem outside of the red blood cell? Well, the problem here is outside the red blood cells, so it's extrinsic. Is it immune or non-immune? It's non-immune and therefore Coombs test will come back negative. There is no antigen antibody reaction. Now, extravascular hemolysis is not involved in HUS, so we will not talk about that today. We have talked about it before. Intravascular hemolysis actually happens in hemolytic uremic syndrome. So what's the problem? The problem, generally speaking, with intravascular hemolysis could be a freaking complement or an IgM antibody, G6PD deficiency, which is a problem in the red blood cell. It could be a macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia or a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. The microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is called Maha. What's the problem in macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia? It's usually a calcific aortic valve. What is the problem in microangiopathic hemolytic anemia? A bunch of platelets decided to clump together and then the red blood cells got sheared, forming cystocytes, and they got destroyed, leading to hemolysis. Hemolysis, when there is hemolysis, there is hemoglobin coming out of the red blood cells. Hemoglobin, as you know, has heme and globin. Heme has iron and protoporphyrin. Protoporphyrin will become unconjugated, but it will go to the liver trying to be conjugated, and there is hyperbilirubinemia sometimes. LDH will rise when there is hemolysis. Also, this hemoglobin that's now floating freely in the bloodstream after the red blood cell has been destroyed will end up in the kidney tubules leading to hemoglobinuria. The iron can lead to hemosiderinuria. So what happened in HUS? Basically, the E. coli 0157H7 released its ugly, nasty, shiga-like toxin. And this shiga-like toxin destroyed the endothelium of my blood vessel. And then the platelets will clump here at the injured side because this is the freaking function of the platelet. It's to clump and try to seal in the gap within the endothelium. Now, the platelets have clumped together, forming this lovely platelet clump. But there is a problem. The red blood cell is big. It cannot pass and cruise through the blood vessel, so it will get absolutely sheared into a schistocyte, also known as fragmented cell, also known as helmet cell. Can you please let me know about the conditions where you see those schistocytes? Of course, there is the macroangiopathic hemolytic anemias and there is the microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. You want macro, a calcified aortic valve such as aortic stenosis. How about microangiopathic hemolytic anemia? You have DIC, TTP, HUS, help me. I'm not gonna help you, you help yourself. You can get a 35% discount towards any product on my website. Use the promo code 35 off cancer at medicosisperfectionalis.com. Thank you for supporting my work. I'm joking. Now let's talk about typical hemolytic uremic syndrome. Remember the typical, the typical is children. The typical has diarrhea. Okay, what's the etiology? Shiga-like toxin of the enterohemorrhagic E. coli. The enterohemorrhagic E. coli is sometimes abbreviated like this, e heck. What the heck is going on? The kid probably consumed undercooked meat, unpasteurized milk, water, or even vegetables that are contaminated with the E. heck. Epidemiology. Children, this is the typical HUS that we are talking about today. Pathophysiology, the EHEC will wreck HEC on the endothelium by their Shiga-like toxin. Shiga-like toxin because it's similar to the Shigella toxin. So the Shigella toxin is known as Shiga toxin. But this is Shigella-like toxin, you can call it a Shigaloid. 
It's like a carcinoma and a carcinoid. An andro and android. Andro means man, that's why. Andrology is the science of studying male reproductive system. But android is man-like, it's a freaking robot. The shigal-like toxin will absolutely hamper and damage the endothelium of the blood vessel. And of course, this damage by itself can lead to bloody diarrhea if this happens inside the GI. But this is not the endothelium of the blood vessel, this is just the epithelium of the GI leading to bloody diarrhea. But the endothelium damage will lead to platelet activation and the platelets will adhere on top of the injured endothelium, which will lead to microangiopathic hemolytic anemia as the red blood cell will get absolutely sheared. Clinically, mucocutaneous bleeding can happen, although many patients are asymptomatic when it comes to the mucocutaneous stuff. Pillar and fatigue because of the freaking anemia, bloody diarrhea, this is the most important one, and uremic stigmata, this is old school. Now go back to your nephrology textbook and recall what are the signs and symptoms of a patient with acute kidney failure. All of them can happen here. Diagnosis. Platelet count is low. It's called hemolytic uremic syndrome and it has a triad. What's the triad? You have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, you have thrombocytopenia and acute renal failure. So of course there is thrombocytopenia and the platelet count is low. If the platelet count is low, this will automatically prolong the bleeding time. We have talked about this before. Peripheral smear, you will see the schistocytes or the fragmented red blood cells or the helmet cells. PT and PTT are absolutely normal because the coagulation cascade or the secondary hemostasis is absolutely fine. What's gonna happen to the red blood cell count when you have anemia? Uh, low hemoglobin, low hematocrit, low. This is the definition of anemia. MCB, normal. This is the definition of normocytic anemia. How about LDH and haptoglobin? LDH is high, haptoglobin is low, and this is the definition of a hemolytic normocytic anemia. Coombs test is negative because it's a non-immune hemolytic normocytic anemia. BioN and creatinine are high because remember there is acute renal failure. It's part of the triad. Oligoria can happen because of the acute kidney failure. Hypertension can happen. Whenever you damage your kidney, blood pressure can go up. Also, you can have it the other way. Whenever you have hypertension, it can screw up your kidney. Also, you can screen the heck out of the EHEC E. coli 0157H7. Treatment! It's a self-limited flipping disease. Just support the kid and it's gonna be fine on his own most of the time. Symptomatic uremia, go with dialysis. If the hemoglobin is less than 7 and hematocrit is oh, this is bad anemia. RBC transfusion, baby. Dialysis should be ready if this is like severe acute kidney injury. Do not transfuse platelets. Again, do not transfuse platelets. Why not? Because remember, the problem was some teeny tiny platelet clumpings here. And these platelets are causing the shearing and the hemolysis and all of this stuff. If you transfuse platelets, they will come here and they will clump. And you have successfully added insult to injury and fuel to the fire. Also, do not say, oh, this kid has a bacterial infection, let me give antibiotics. Oh, shut up. It's a self-limited disease. So, do not give platelets, do not give antibiotics. HUS, main cause, Shiga-like toxin of the E. coli 0157H7. It's a Shiga-like toxin, we call this a Shiga toxin E. coli or STEC. Okay, this is the most common one. Another E. coli is called the O104H4. Other causes of hemolytic uremic syndrome include pneumococcus. So this is a kid with pneumonia, hemolytic uremic syndrome, and renal failure that requires dialysis. This is nasty. Non-shiga toxin type of infections, salmonella, shigella. Oh, oh, how come the shigella is a non-shiga toxin type? Because shigella produces uh, shiga toxin, not shiga-like toxin. Big difference, baby. Other causes include complement disorders, defect in the complement factor H, I, or B, medications such as oral contraceptives or quinine therapy, others such as lupus, APS, and pregnancy. This is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Don't forget that influenza virus can lead to HUS. Why does it sound like my phone number 0157H7? Okay, the O is the lipopolysaccharide antigen and the H is the flagella antigen of the flipping E. coli bacteria. Okay, remember, you know, this is similar to what? You remember influenza? You know, H1N1. Why do we call it H1N1? H is the hemagglutinin and N is the neuraminidase. 
So scientists have noticed that not all influenza are created equal. We have subclasses, we have different subtypes of influenza. So let's differentiate between them. How would you distinguish between them? Uh, based on their active stuff, like the active component? Uh, yeah, and it's always a protein. They have the hemagglutinin protein and the neuraminidase, which is an enzyme, which is a freaking protein. Because the active thing in your body is always a protein. That's why all of your enzymes are proteins, all your pumps are proteins. All your channels are proteins and all of your receptors are proteins without which pharmacology is history. So we divide E. coli into many subtypes according to the O antigen and the H antigen. According to your platelet count, I can expect your symptoms. Most patients with HUS are here. It's not very severe. However, the bloody diarrhea is there. So the mucocutaneous bleeding such as your petechia purpura ecchymosis are not always there, not usually. But blood diarrhea is almost always there. I've told you before that SLE, APS, CLL, of these can lead to secondary autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Oh, and they can also lead to microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, but this time is not immune. So try to connect the dots together, folks. And we have talked about this before. In a nutshell, hemolytic uremic syndrome is a triad. It's a triangle. It has microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and acute renal failure. And don't forget the bloody diarrhea. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, you have low hemoglobin, low hematocrit, low red blood cell count, MCV is normal, LDH could be high, you see the sister side, this is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Thrombocytopenia equals low platelet count but prolonged bleeding time. Acute renal failure equals high BUNN creatinine and maybe oliguria, sometimes there is hypertension. This is pycmonic, baby. Look at this. Hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is hemolysis. Uremic is the urembo syndrome. What's happening? Look at the triangle, man. Okay, what's here? Look at this. This is hemolysis. So this is the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. This is the trombone for thrombocytopenia. And this is the renal failure. Why did it happen? It's an E. coli. Acute diarrhea. Look at this acute angle diarrhea. And it's a bloody diarrhea. Look at this blood in the intestine. There is endothelial damage here. Let's go to the lab. You see the helmet cell, which is the cystocytes, and the LDH is high. How do you manage it? Supportive care with some fluids and electrolytes, and if it's bad, dial the dialysis. Let's talk about the EHEC. We have the E. coli 0157H7. It's associated with undercooked hamburger. It's a gram-negative bacteria. Here is the negative devil. It causes bloody diarrhea, so here is a red toilet. There is hemolytic anemia, there is hemolysis. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, as you know, the famous triad. We have hemolysis, we have the renal failure, and we have the thrombocytopenia. Try to look at these two picmonics for a while and you will remember them for a long time. You can go to picmonic.com slash VIP hookup slash medicosis and try them for free. They are great. Question of the day. A five-year-old boy had hemolytic uremic syndrome, but his fibrinogen level was high in the serum. Please explain. How come? I've just told you that secondary hemostasis is fine. How come fibrinogen is high? Thank you for watching, you bloody lovely people. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to pickmonic.com slash VIP hookup slash Metacosis, and they will hook you up. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Metacosis Perfectionist, where medicine makes perfect sense.